This is the year 2015 because some monks poked through some historical records, took their best guess at the year that Jesus was born, called that year zero, and ever since then we've been counting up. But did the monks get it right? Was year zero the year that Jesus of Nazareth was really born? Was year zero the year that Jesus was born? The short answer is probably not. They didn't keep detailed records of every birth then. It's not like we found a birth certificate. Jesus was born in Kenya. The limited evidence we have to go on comes from attempting to corroborate the dates of certain historical figures that are mentioned in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. Both Matthew and Luke place the birth of Jesus during the reign of King Herod of Judea. In Luke's case, this association with Herod is a little bit more nebulous. Luke actually says that during the reign of Herod, there was a priest named Zechariah, and Zechariah and Elizabeth together go on to have the baby who was called John the Baptist. Now, since Elizabeth and Mary are pregnant at roughly the same time in Luke's story, Elizabeth being six months more advanced than Mary, the assumption is that Mary's child was also born during the reign of Herod, but Herod doesn't figure any further into Luke's narrative. Well, Herod figures very prominently into Matthew's narrative, of course. It's in Matthew's gospel that we're given the story of the Magi who come looking for the baby, meet with Herod, and Herod says that he would like to go worship this prophesied child, but the Magi don't return to Herod to let Herod know where the baby is, so Herod then has to go and order that all of the children under two years of age in Bethlehem be killed because he's trying to prevent this prophesied child from coming and taking over his kingdom. As such, Joseph has to take his family and flee into exile in Egypt, and they don't return until after Herod is dead. Incidentally, it's this part of the story where Joseph, Mary, and Jesus go into exile in Egypt that is the part where Jesus actually becomes a refugee. Not the part in Luke where Mary and Joseph come to Bethlehem due to the census. We're going to deal with that story in another episode. So here's the catch about having Herod involved in the Nativity story. King Herod of Judea died in the year 4 BCE, four years before Jesus was supposedly born. But no big deal, we just say that Jesus was born a few years earlier, those monks were dealing with incomplete records anyway, and now everything matches up again and everything is hunky-dory, right? Wrong, because Luke actually mentions another historical figure which we can use to attempt to establish the date of Jesus' birth. Luke says that in those days there was a census conducted over all the known world, and that this census was conducted when Quirinius was governor in Syria. Now Quirinius was a real historical person who really was governor in Syria, and really did conduct a census. The problem is that Quirinius didn't be become governor of Syria, and that census didn't happen until the year 6 CE, six years after the supposed birth of Jesus in the year zero, and over a decade after the death of King Herod of Judea. So there's no period in time in which all of these facts are true. Herod was king in Judea, and Quirinius was governor in Syria, there was a census, and there was a slaughter of the children in Bethlehem so that we could line it up and pick the right date for when Jesus was born based on this historical data. Instead of providing us with a clear date, looking to the historical figures actually gives us a range of about a dozen years, starting somewhere six years before the Common Era and going six years into the Common Era in which Jesus could have been born, but at none of those times would all of the facts of the two nativity narratives of our Bible perfectly line up. So which one seems more probable, Herod or Quirinius? Well, Herod is mentioned in both Matthew and Luke, so you might give him a leg up there, but the problem is that the main event that Herod is connected with in the Nativity story, the slaughter of the innocents, there's no record of it ever happening. And a king ordering a bunch of children killed is the sort of thing that there would probably be some kind of record of. So does that mean the advantage goes to Quirinius, who at least we know actually did conduct a census? Well, not really. Since the way that Luke describes the census occurring in his gospel bears no relation to the way that censuses were actually conducted in the Roman world. First of all, Luke says that this census went out to all the known world, when in fact the census that Quirinius conducted was just of the Palestine region. But we can forgive that as just an example of dramatic exaggeration. The more serious issue is that Luke says that Jesus' family had to go to Bethlehem in order to be registered. And this is the part that makes no sense. No government has ever conducted a census by requiring their entire population to migrate back to places of origin in order to be counted in the census. That would be a logistical nightmare. 
Instead of having all of the people move around, they send census takers around to the different areas in order to conduct the census. Furthermore, since the point of a census is actually to figure out how many people are in a particular area, and to connect the people in that area with the property that's in that area in order to figure out how to tax them, the government actually wouldn't want people leaving their homes and their businesses and their fields and all their property behind in order to go back to wherever their family was originally from, because then the government wouldn't be able to figure out who owns this business? Who owns this field, this plot of land? Who's actually here for us to be able to tax? All right, what's going on here? Luke appears to have fictionalized his census and conflated two historical figures who weren't in power at the same time, while Matthew appears to have fictionalized an incident with Herod killing babies in Bethlehem. How are we supposed to get to the historical truth behind these stories? And the answer is that trying to get to the historical truth behind the nativity stories is a huge red herring because these are not historical narratives that we're dealing with. These are theologically laden and motivated stories. They are, in other words, mythology. And I use mythology here not in the sense that these stories are untrue, but in the sense that the purpose of these stories lies beneath the surface. That the purpose of these stories is in conveying a message which is useful for the interpreter, for the reader who uses it in their life, for shaping their life, for providing a sense of purpose and direction to their life as a whole. One of Matthew's unique agendas in his gospel is to convey to his audience that Jesus is the new Moses, that he is that figure uniquely entitled by virtue of his relationship to God, to reinterpret, radically revise, or even to create new commandments for his followers to obey. In service of this agenda, it's natural that Matthew sets up Jesus' infancy as a parallel to Moses' infancy. Just as Moses is born in a period when Pharaoh is ordering all of the baby boys of the Israelites to be murdered, so Jesus is born in a period when Herod orders all of the baby boys in Bethlehem to be murdered. And when Jesus' family goes into exile in Egypt, that trip to and out of Egypt is symbolic of the Exodus story itself. Whereas one of Luke's primary agendas in his gospel is to show that the life of Jesus was the site of the main conflict between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Caesar. So it's appropriate in Luke's gospel that Jesus' life begin with the power of Caesar looming through the census, his ability to count and number and tax and enforce his will upon all the known world. The power of the nativity stories is not in the biographical details about Jesus or the historical facts that they supposedly provide for us, but the glimpse that they offer us into the theological reasonings of the authors of the Gospels. The most important parts of any story are the beginning and the end. The end is how you tie everything up and ultimately seal the deal on the impact that your narrative is going to have on the reader. But the beginning, the beginning is where you lay the foundation for them to begin to see what your point or purpose is in the story ahead. Neither Mark nor John's Gospels even contain a nativity narrative, and Matthew's and Luke's versions are substantially different from each other. So the unique beginning of every single Gospel Gospel sets up for us the distinctive theological concerns and emphases of each of the communities that these Gospels were directed toward. This is just the beginning. Stay tuned for the rest of the series because everything that you know about Christmas is wrong.